um, this Onward event um, on what is, I think, perhaps the most timely subject matter of our entire conference fringe. And actually, before I begin, can I just, um, just think, please do come forward. There are lots of people sitting at the back. Please do come forward. Don't be shy. Um, uh, uh, it's much better if you can see you properly. Um, uh, so for those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Will Tanner. I'm the director of Onwards. Uh, we are a think tank focused on levelling up opportunities, strengthening community in every part of the UK, and particularly in those parts of the UK where economic opportunity, by, where social fabric has been in decline um, for many years. Um, and today we're talking uh, about, as I say, one of the most timely subjects of this conference, um, how life sciences clusters um, can drive economic growth. Um, and uh, I want to start by just thanking uh, our panel, um, in particular uh, the Minister for joining us, despite the fact that she's only I think 18 or 19 days into the brief, um, uh, although I have no doubt that, she, um, that she's going to be completely brilliant in it. Um, um, and also to the NHSA for, um, for working with Onwards uh, on this event and for putting it on. It's actually the, I think, the second or third year that we've been um, working with NHSA, um, and uh, it's always fantastic to, to partner with you and to hear what's going on um, in Northern Life Sciences and the opportunity uh, there. Um, so you don't need me to tell you why this is a timely event. Um, uh, you just need to look around this room. Uh, we are all here because of the enormous value, the ingenuity, the innovation that comes out of the life sciences industry, um, especially in the UK um, where uh, we are a world leader. Uh, we are a top three global hub for life sciences, number one recipient for foreign direct investment in Europe. The industry employs 250,000 people around the country. Um, and that's increased by over 20,000 since 2010. So there's been a really strong economic impact from life sciences for, for a long time. Um, and the, the products of um, the life sciences in, uh, industry over the last year and a half are in part supported by government. So I'm sure our panelists might touch on this, but I was in government in 2017 when the industrial strategy was published. Uh, in that industrial strategy, and it's, it's kind of younger sibling, the life sciences industrial strategy, uh, were several initiatives which um, provided some of the foundations for, for the success uh, in the last year, things like the cell and gene therapy catapults, uh, advanced therapies treatment centres, uh, vaccine manufacturing innovation centre, those are the building blocks of some of our pandemic response over the last year and a half. And I think we should be really grateful for government intervention over a number of years to support the life sciences industry. Um, but we're here to talk about how we can go further and how we can move further as a kind of partnership between private and, and public sector um, because we know uh, that this sector has the opportunity to, to bring high skilled R&D intensive jobs, um, not just to the Golden Triangle, but to all parts of the UK. Um, and I'm really interested in hearing from our panel and from all of you on the ways in which we can do that as we recover from the pandemic um, and uh, start to bring back um, jobs and prosperity to parts of the country where they haven't been. So you haven't come here to listen to me, so I'm going to stop talking largely now. Um, and it just it forced me to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, they need no introduction, um, but uh, in order, I will come to uh, Maggie Fruit, MP, who is the Minister for Vaccines and Public Health. Um, as I say, a brief uh, she took on uh, a matter of weeks ago, um, but she does so with uh, a huge amount of, um, of experience uh, in uh, um, medical science as a medical laboratory scientist um, uh, for, for many years. Um, uh, so possibly the, the best qualified um, vaccine minister that this country has had for some time um, and, uh, and someone really well equipped to take the country out of the pandemic and deal with, with the remaining vaccine challenges that, that, that we face um, uh, with regard to coronavirus. I will then come to Dr. Catherine McKay, um, who is the Director of Life Sciences at Broadwood SciTech. Um, she's also on the board of the NHSA. Um, I will then come to Catherine Fletcher, MP, um, who is uh, the MP uh, for South Ribble, a uh, member of the Science and Technology uh, Select Committee, um, also a PPS uh, in the government of Alok Sharma. Um, uh, so, so and holds a biology degree. And holds a biology degree. We, we can all give our um, <laughs> educational histories if we want. Um, uh, but, uh, but no, uh, but it's, it's someone who, um, uh, so we've worked with uh, a little bit at Onward through the levelling up task force that we have with MPs, and someone I know who's talked really deeply about these issues really ambitious also for our, our country and, and different parts of our country as well to succeed in this area. Um, and finally, I will come to Dr. Seamus O'Neill, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Northern Health Science Alliance, uh, and I'm sure he would talk about the work that they've done, both in terms of uh, driving innovation within the sector, but also the research that they've done and some of the economic opportunity that has. 
Um, so we only have uh, until uh, two thirty. Um, uh, so uh, we have limited time. I want to get the best value out of that time. So I'm going to stop talking now, um, and I'm going to hand over to our first panelist, uh, Maggie. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. And as Will said, I'm a newly appointed Minister for Vaccines and Public Health. And the Prime Minister has tasked me with finding those 5 million people who haven't yet been vaccinated, the, making sure that the booster programme is rolled out smoothly, and also the programme for the 12 to 15 year olds. And that is quite a different delivery model, so that has its challenges in itself. From a public health side, he's tasked me with uh, halving child abuse by 2030. Uh, tackling drug addiction and also making the UK smoke free by 2030. So no small uh, challenge at all there. And uh, as Will said, uh, that you, it's actually levelling up, it's levelling up through, uh, through health and that's really my remit. So uh, huge tasks ahead, uh, but uh, I say I'll relish a challenge. It's great to be here in Manchester. Uh, Manchester is the academic home of a number of Nobel Prize winners, including Ernest Rutherford, and it's where I got my degree in biology as well. So we've got two uh, <laughs> two degrees in biology. Uh, so it's and that beginning really inspired me to take up my career in life sciences. First of all, as a uh, biomedical scientist, and then into the pharmaceutical industry, uh, specifically in mental diagnostics, and was again involved in the biology lab. But then really enabled me to champion life sciences in Parliament. And I've done that from really being elected in 2015 through the, um, the Health Select Committee and championing different issues on that. And I think perhaps I, I spoke out too many times and mainly in PPS in that department, uh, so I couldn't speak any longer. And then uh, giving my voice back after being a whip for a while was again the responsibility for the Department of Health and Social Care. So life sciences have been my life. Really, and it's really, yeah, I feel really honoured to now be able to deliver on some of those commitments that the Prime Minister has made. And it's life sciences, I think yeah, we've always known how important it, it is as an industry, but it's almost like a bit of an invisible giant that we don't see and dance about it enough. And I think through the pandemic, we've been able to see and dance about it a lot more, and we should continue to do so because it's so important. It's worth £80 billion. Pounds. Uh, 5,000 companies are involved in it, and uh, as Will said, a quarter of a million people are employed in it. Uh, so it's, and it's seen as a world leader, and we need to make sure it stays that way, and I'm sure it will, because we've got lots of people behind it, really fighting for it, which is so important. And the, the pandemic has really reinforced its importance. But also the pandemic, and particularly with the Vaccines Task Force, uh, it's shown how important it is for every work together, the academics, uh, industry, the NHS, uh, government and charities, the voluntary sector is so, so important. I think that's how we need to move forward as we go on to develop more of the life sciences and keep it more leading. Maggie, thank you so much uh, and it's brilliant to have someone uh, with your background um, and your passion for life sciences in the group, so thank you um, for joining us today. Um, fantastic, I'm now going to turn to Kat. Thank you, Will. Um, my name is Kath Mackay. I'm Director of Life Sciences at an organisation called Rob Sciatech. Um, I also am a scientist, life scientist by training, um, slight bit of diversity. I don't have a biology degree, but I have a pharmacology degree. So, <laughs> so it's a slight bit of diversity here in terms of background. Um, and I'm a scientist now working in a property company, which is never where I thought I'd end up, but just joking earlier, it goes to show kind of a good quality life science degree will, will really get you anywhere. Um, Brockwood SciTech is a joint venture between the property company Brockwood and Legal in general and we are the, the largest property company working in the science and tech space and we're creating a network of innovation districts uh, around the UK. Um, we own um, uh, campuses in central Manchester, the City Labs development, we own the Oldley Park Life Science Campus which is just down the road in Cheshire. It's home to 200 um, life science companies and is part of the thriving um, science corridor in, in Cheshire. Um, we also own sites in Liverpool, <coughs> Leeds, Birmingham, and, um, and recently we, we acquired a campus in Cambridge. Um, I'm also really proud to be a board member of the, uh, the NHSA too. Um, prior to joining Broadway SciTech, I was on the executive management team of Innovate UK, where I, had on, I, I led on life sciences, 
and, um, and in various other roles, I've worked in the private sector in corporate development and business development roles. So I think I've got this interesting, albeit slightly mangled experience of um, private sector, public sector, uh, and now back in the, the, the private sector again, working in a, in a UK role. And I think, I suppose I'm gonna talk now to some of my thoughts about the sector and, and what that experience is, um, has, has um, kind of brought me. Um, I'm, I, to echo the colleague statements, I'm, I'm just so proud that the life science industry is front and centre of everyone's minds. Um, it's been great that actually, you know, people, I like, you know, friends and family knew I did something in science, and, and you know, now they really, really care. I think because of COVID, because of the development of the vaccine, um, you know, the genomics capability that led us in the in the UK to be in that leadership position of understanding about different variants, where they were spreading. That's all UK technology, and my friends, my family, uh, my colleagues in the property industry have never been more interested in what I do and the sector in which I work, and it's absolutely fantastic to be, to be part of that. Um, you heard some of the UK-wide stats earlier. Um, I think what's interesting is there is so much of that happening in the regions throughout the UK. Um, with my Bromford SciTech hat on, we are developing a science campus in Birmingham. It's uh, joint venture from the SciTech with the University of Birmingham and Birmingham Health Partners and we're looking to create a new 200 million pound campus in Birmingham. There's great expertise on the clinical side, the academic side, but um, much of the industry there is, is tiny businesses, many of them, but very small. So there's huge untapped potential in the Midlands um, and that's where we're, we're going to be working um, over the next couple of years to develop a commercial science campus and bring industry into that region. Where I have most experience and where we have great maturity is the life science industry in the north. And I'm not going to steal too much of Seamus is under, who will talk about the NHSA's efforts in really articulating that northern supercluster. But there is huge, um, not only potential, but experience here in the north. Experience in medicines manufacturing, advanced therapies, um, data and AI, med tech and diagnostics. Uh, and it's not a case of asking for investment to create something. A lot of that UK leading and in fact world leading infrastructure is here in the UK. Um, when Brum uh, in the north of the UK, when, when Brumford bought the Oldley Park Life Science Campus in 2014, um, it was, many of you will know, it was the former AZ Global R&D site um, and they were relocating that, that organisation down to Cambridge. And, through, in a seven year period, we've really transformed the site and it, it's been hard work, but actually there is that talent base of people in the North. There is that base of hungry SMEs that are innovating in, in drug discovery, therapeutics, diagnostics. And we're now at the point where over a period of seven years, we've transformed that site into a world leading science campus. And we've been able to do that because it's a great um, intellect, people, ideas, um, and industry that we, we have in the north. And I think there's huge potential to unlock further economic growth if we um, further invest in that infrastructure and capability. And I think leveling up, it, you know, the life science industry is a huge opportunity for leveling up given these assets and these clusters are now in a mature state and they're in the north. So I think backing um, the NHSA's vision um, to further invest into the, the life science supercluster is incredibly power, powerful and very credible given the infrastructure and the people that we, we already have in, in the North. Um, I'll just finish off by saying that it's the role of industry in that investment is, is absolutely critical. Um, and when investments are made into infrastructure, you really have got to think about how businesses will engage and whether it's fit the purpose for business to use. Um, Obviously, thinking of the government's targets around um, R&D investment, you know, 2.4% of GDP, you know, you'll be aware of that, but a lot of that investment has got to come from the private sector working with the public sector. So there's got to be a reason for the private sector to engage, and we've got to think about that. I'll finish on an example of some of the work we've done in Manchester. Um, our organisation was brought in um, as a partner to acquire the old Manchester Science Park. Um, at the time we acquired it, in 2012, um, it was quite an insular, um, staid, local authority business park and the, the local authority had real ambition to bring in a developer to really unlock the potential of that site. So we did that in a joint venture with the University of Manchester and the Hospital Trust 
and we were able to transform that site into a thriving business community. And it was great to have a local authority on board um, in, in terms of developing the site. We got to work closely with the university, so supporting entrepreneurs of the future, getting them to spin out businesses and put them on the site, and working really closely with the University of Manchester Foundation Hospital Trust, we're able to create links into clinicians that helps grow our businesses and helps provide a suitable income for the NHS organisations too. And that's a great example um, of the private sector working hand in hand with the public sector organisations. So I think if you get it right, there's a huge amount of growth you can unlock and we're being asked to take that model into other cities around the UK now. So it started here in Manchester, um, working with a, uh, with a really ambitious um, hospital trust who saw the potential in working with a, with a private sector developer and now that's the envy of other cities around the UK, um, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, so yeah, I think great potential, I think, for, for unlocking economic growth, but further investment in our northern life science assets. Cal, thank you so much. Um, that was brilliant. And perhaps in the Q&A we might get into specifically how to get that partnership right between public and private sector, because I think that's one of the key questions for this whole thing. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Hey, welcome to my hometown. Here's from Manchester. Are we in Manchester? <coughs> yeah. Uh, that's what it looked like. <laughs> but but, but I, that, there's a point to that. I mean, I, I'm up near South River now, and I've got some friends in. But there's a there's a point around theme and pride in place that I want to return to this because that is actually part of the life sciences journey. So uh, rather than sending the minister and I, the minister's biology degree is from Manchester and she's originally from Nottingham, and my biology degree is from Nottingham and I'm originally from Manchester. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, well, fair, close enough. Yeah, yeah. Oh, All right, so, right, but you know what I mean? There's that kind of swapping over and how kind of clusters and agglomeration economics comes into it. So I'm particularly interested in not stealing the thunder of the wonderful examples uh, that we saw on our visit to Manchester as part of the Science and Tech Select Committee, but maybe to describe to you the pride that it was generating and the knock-on effects elsewhere. So we go and see a, a very genuinely innovative um, uh, you know, set up in a place, physical place, right next to the Frankhurst Museum, if anyone's interested in Manchester. Um, and then but what you're then getting is different people coming in and pursuing different aspects and rolling forward. So I know the title of this is what can the life sciences do to drive kind of levelling up, but I would say what can levelling up do to drive the life sciences as well. So with my kind of undergraduate hat on, obviously a huge amount of the future of life sciences is going to be about personalised medicine which is about crunching huge amounts of data to understand the complexity of each one of us as individuals. But if you've got the <clears throat> skills, capability, technology base to crunch data about human genome, it would also be helpful if you had GCHQ or the National Cyber Force that's just been announced recently at Preston and how actually we can start to work together within the industry, within within the region to supply a set of skills that help not only this sector but others. Um, and I would also kind of draw the eye maybe in the Q&A to, yes, all right, the very clever stuff that goes on in the sites that CAS provides and the incentives that the minister provides and you know that the NHS AF advocate for. But, but almost invariably, at some point, you've got to be boots on the ground. You know, you've got to get the rubber hit the road. So let's not forget Wrexham, right at the end of the M56, whose bottling plant has been, you know, a crucial part of the vaccine rollout. And, you know, Wrexham, what, 45 minute drive from here on a good day, maybe an hour. You know, there are clusters that don't necessarily obey geographic communities, but that we all work well together on. So I'll pause there, because I think the q and is the interesting bit. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was great. And it, it's actually really, really welcome to have someone link this back to that question of kind of civic pride and, and belonging in a private place, um, which is intrinsic to the leveling up agenda. But we can get lost if we focus overly on the economic at the expense of other things, because these things interrelate. Like these things, uh, in order to level up some of the places that we might be talking about, we need to both bring back jobs and bring back pride. And those two things go hand in hand. Um, and we should be focusing on both rather than just one. Thank you. Um, finally, but my name is Lee, so I'm going to come to um, Seamus O'Neill. Seamus. Thanks, Will. Um, I, I'm going to have to have a word with Lauren here because normally they give us MPs who 
uh, have got a policy philosophy and economics degrees. <laughs> they're, a lot, they're a lot easier to bluff. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really worried here that my dean can't actually know what they're talking about. Um, I'm a geneticist by background. Uh, like, uh, um, like my dean, you know, started life in the NHS labs. Um, and ended up running networks uh, in, in clinical uh, services to get access to patients and to work with companies in the NHS and then uh, end up running a clinical trials network for the NIHR and, uh, and then eventually uh, this role uh, looking after the Northern Health Science Alliance. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're a membership organization. We've got uh, the, all the big NHS trusts uh, across the north all the big teaching hospitals, then we've got the, the research intensive universities, um, and we've got the academic health science networks who do it, uh, a role in adoption of innovation. So we, we are the advocacy, um, we've got an advocacy role for them, we've got a, a role to coordinate working with industry, and it's, it's no longer unusual to hear the story that Kath told there about the Manchester Teaching Trust. Um, you know, being being driven at least as much by the the, the economic welfare of their region as they are by the, the services that they deliver. The the people who run these organisations in NHS are acutely aware of the role they have as employers, as trainers, as drivers of economic growth. And one of the roles that we do in the NHSA is we we we, we, we harness that, and we and we try to. Um, Get them to play nicely together. I think is the technical <laughs> managerial term, because the north is a the north's a difficult entity to, to capture. It's, a, it's geographically defined by the North Sea and the, the Scotland and sort of the M62. But it's 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 a hard identity. I, I've spent thirty years living and working in the North East. It's a very clear geographic identity, sort of identity. Manchester, passionate, um, Liverpool. The, you know the, 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 these these cities have great identities in their own right, and that's that's a real asset when you're trying to get people to join in clinical trials, for example, trust the system with their data. To, the, these are, these are um, precious elements of what we are trying to do here in working with industry, that element of trust and identity. But mobilizing people across competing universities or competing NHS trusts to, to a common goal is actually quite easy if the common goal is economic growth because people, you cannot keep pe fixing people up in hospitals and general practice and send them back to unhealthy environments, poor jobs, and the, and the conditions that create health inequalities and poor health. Mm -hmm. Even Public Health England will tell you that your health is 80% down to your life chances and 20% down to the care you get. So it's not, uh, it's not a big leap for people running billion pound organisations in Newcastle to understand that their role has to be more than just patching people up. They need to be driving economic growth. So I think, go back to Catherine's point, that that, how do we make that the norm? The NHS is the biggest employer in the UK. It, my argument would be that it should be the biggest skills provider in the UK as well. The people who are training in, you know, in the drivers, the project managers, the data managers, that you should be, that there, there's a role for the NHS potentially is untapped in terms of skills and skills generation. But I want to, I want to just briefly touch on this idea of clusters. Um, Everybody's mentioned it so far, but again, it's a very difficult concept to uh, you to capture precisely. Um, the, the, de the academic definition of a cluster is geographically based, you know, common purpose, common industry suppliers, uh, investors. Manchester Oxford Road will call itself a cluster. Derrysbury will still call itself a cluster. Um, but the th one of the things is scale. And that's where the NHSA comes in, is that uh, the, as a northern entity, we can just about compete on the world stage. It's not us against the Golden Triangle. We need to augment the excellence in the UK to do things in the north that can be done in the north and should be done in the north. We need our fair share of that 2.4% of GDP. But given that, as Kath says, we have the assets that can, can position the UK than the global economy in the fastest growing part of the system, which is life sciences. The, the, the vaccine story is probably the only thing that has secured the UK's reputation in the last two years. We didn't exactly rip up trees in, in much of the rest of what we did, but the creating vaccines <coughs> and sequencing 
we didn't manage it properly in law school companies did, but we, our life sciences base got us through this. And we don't know what the next problem is going to be. We don't, you know, it, uh, anti antibiotic resistance could, in terms of deaths, in terms of economic toll, could knock COVID off the map in the next 10 years. Global warming, the technical requirements of dealing with the climate change. We need a science base, we need a well-funded science base that's joined up. And that's what we try to do in a cluster across the north. So when we're talking about advanced therapies, all the advanced therapies practitioners, all those big hospitals, all those big universities, talk together under an NHSA banner. Because there's no point investing in one site in advanced therapies. You really need multiple <coughs> linked sites to work with industry and scale. And that'll bring the jobs to the north, that'll create the, the quality of life and the opportunities and the skills that will turn down. And that takes time. So we need investment, fair share of investment, we need time and we need some local autonomy. Because we need one of the the greatest benefit that this UK system can have now is joining things up, not creating new catapults to create new uh, structures. I think we need to join up and get what we have working much better. And that's what we're and that's what we try to do. Thank you very much. Lots of different perspectives, but lots of very reinforcing perspectives, I think, very clear focus on, uh, on, on kind of practical activity, boots on the ground, as, as Catherine said, um, uh, kind of a real approach to, to kind of active strategic clustering, thinking about where our assets are and how we can augment them and build on the strengths that we've already got. Um, uh, and also uh, this clear focus of public and private partnership. Um, and it, I was very struck changed by your point that our real competitors are not, yeah, as a competitor, North is not the golden triangle, it's, yeah. it's uh, international competitors. Um, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, uh, and a need for a need for um, UK to, to think strategically long term uh, as a whole economy rather than just hitting different parts of the from London. So uh, I'm now going to open up to the floor for questions. I have some of my own questions if you are shy, but if people <laughs> would like to ask questions, if you want to put up your hand, I'll probably take a couple at a time and pose them to our panel. Um, does anyone have any questions or shall I kick off? We have one at the back, a gentleman at the back, and a gentleman over here. So gentleman at the back, if you want to say, say where you're from as well, if that's possible. Uh, yeah, sure, Colin Neal from Roche. Um, when we talk about life science investment, we're often quite focused on, on research, but another area of, of investments is, is actually getting, getting new therapies, new tests, new, new kind of devices to market. I think that's something we do, we probably do better in the North of England than we, than we do elsewhere. So the, the AHSN network in particular, uh, Yorkshire and Humber AHSN, I think is probably uh, one of the best in the country. I'll say one of, so it's not to offend anyone else listening. But I think where it, where it falls short is, is actually then the scale up. So that, that network is intended to, if you prove your case, it will be rolled out throughout the whole of the UK. But so often there is this desire to, to reinvent and I think there is a, a, a slight kind of snobbishness in other parts of the UK about where the might have worked in Manchester, but we, you know, we're not going to do it here in Devon. I, I'm interested in the panel's views on, on you know, how do we get past that kind of perennial problem. Thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen here. Hi, I'm Merwin Armstrong. I own a medical diagnostics company. Um, I've become extremely frustrated over the last 18 months where the government has vacillated between, oh, we must develop diagnostics in the UK on one hand, and on the other hand, they awarded the tender for 600 million tests to China, which means there's be 600 million pounds going to China, some of which could have been invested. There are companies who actually took the government at their word, invested in manufacturing their left hand drive. The, the government is solely working on the cost, no investment in the industry. We don't actually have a sizable diagnostic manufacturing industry in the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm in partnership with many companies in China. I would love to invest in manufacturing in the UK, but if I don't have a customer, there's no point. You know, so the government's got to make up its mind. Do we really want to support UK industry? Or do we want to sound, in this case, uh, I think we're now at about uh, two to three billion 
points to China to let them invest. And believe me, the companies I deal with have over a thousand R&D engineers working in this life sciences sector. Uh, and we are feeding them money to continue to develop it and starving what's happening in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. So two brilliant questions there to kick us off. So um, the first question around reinvention, which I think speaks quite keenly to uh, Seamus' point about uh, the kind of key question being to join up rather than to create new, uh, new things. Um, so perhaps I'll come to you first on that question, Seamus. And then the second question um, around this kind of question of resilience and, um, and UK supply chains, um, uh, kind of talking about boosting UK supply chains, but at the same time, commissioning or what kind of buying products from overseas, how can we use public procurement better to, to support the UK industry? And perhaps I'll come to Maggie on that one if I can. But Seamus, if I come first to you and I'll, I'll bring in others as well as we can. Um, I'm going to ignore the chap at the back from Ross because he said that yours should not be the best. I used to call the North East one. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold from that one. But the two questions are, are very closely connected, I think. It's about commitment to doing things in practice in the UK. I, I think what adoption of proven technologies and investment in the manufacturing base in particular, the development base, both of them require co-development with companies. They require a commitment from the system, a joined up system, to understand what is needed by the health and care system. Where we can, we help UK companies to understand that. We help them with access to the NHS, to patients, to data, and all the rest. As we go along, we iterate the developments of the technology, and then those technologies are known and <coughs> known to and trusted by the system that has helped to co-develop them. I think that's the, that's the innovation, the invention through evaluation to adoption system that the UK needs to create because there's no, there's no benefit in a globalised world in a race to the bottom on cost. I think Mervyn's absolutely right. I think we need to commit to being a high quality, high trust environment where the world knows that the UK is still a trusted partner and where the good evidence comes from. And actually it tells, me, it tells the rest of the world, no, it doesn't work. Or yes, it does work and we use it in the NHS. I think that's the, that's the high end, high value economy that we've got to pitch at. But Merv is absolutely right. That takes a commitment, a long-term commitment, not to go to a race to the bottom on cost just because you've got a globalised supply chain. What you end up with then is you can't even manufacture the tubes when you need them to take bloods because you don't have that manufacturing base in the country. I think you've got to look after that. But the way to do it, I think, is through co-development with the industry. Not taking liberties with the NHS, but taking it as a trusted partner to develop what's needed. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to Catherine uh, next on this. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, I think the premise of your question is absolutely spot on. I think we are getting really good at integrating the academic research with the NHS assets, with the civic pride and the ambition to generate stuff that's really wows us. Um, what we are not as brilliant at, although the, some of the facilities that City, Tech, City Labs are doing is great, is then allowing that scale up to become you know, profitable industry and well-rooted jobs here. But I don't think this is exclusively about life sciences. So when we visited with the science and tech industry, you know, they can't, I used to, I, I'm with all love, because I used to work in the city, but they can't get people on the, chi on the train to call up and see us. You know, I think that we, we are, we are going to have to slightly get over this northern diffidence and go and sell it in a big flashy way and say get on that train because this is ace and there is the opportunity. So we were speaking to a, a chap who couldn't get the City of London guys to come. He had five Americans fighting over his investment based in Manchester. So whilst it's not line sciences specific, I think there is a role for you know, northern politicians, northern business leaders to actually really start selling this and pointing out the opportunities there. In the, in the areas where we're specialist. And then if you want to roll that forward, you don't just want people, you know, I can understand people might think it's a bit dubious if some woman called Catherine Fletcher and starts going, it's marvellous, you're going to make a fortune, come up here. But 
What we can also do is we can start describing accurately and factually why actually investments here are in of their interests. So we've got great research centres. We've got kind of a kind of pride and practical nows to make things happen. I'll just tell you a funny one from a medical firm in my patch that I went to this week in a minute. But we've got the space to expand. We've got the end-to-end -end supply chain. Admittedly not perfect, but you know you can bottle it in Wrexham and you can design it in Manchester or Liverpool. And I think we need to be much better at telling the story about why it's great to invest. But if I may, just so there's a, a firm in my patch who's um, a medical manufacturing care products. They they've been supplying Pfizer with that minimum. Um, minimum left in the needle needle to help them get an extra uh, an extra shot of Pfizer vaccine out. Two billion of the things they've done. Anyway, they buy a new machine to sort out sanitization. It's got to come from Turkey. It's COVID. Turkey is a red list country. It needs six engineers to install it. This multi million pound machine. What does the lad called Gary from Lancashire do? He, he, he knows that his granddad put things together without a manual and his dad did it because this northern pride. So he just did 100 hour weeks and put it together on his own without the engineers. You can't buy that ambition, that pride, that now that know-how. So it's not just the high-end stuff, it's come and do all the rest of it. And I think if we can do anything, we sell that story and we're on a winner here. Just, just the record, we're not recommending that we all go away and put, try and put together. No, no, because we're not, we're not, but we're not all Gary's, but he did it. He did it. He did it. He put the machine. Yeah, Amazing story. Um, just, just pick up on one thing you just said, Catherine. Um, it's a, the point that you made about um, kind of getting over the dividends and going and selling. I think is really vital. And if you look at the FDI statistics um, that come out of government, I mean, the, the extraordinary amount of FDI go to London because that's the place that people fly into. That's the place that has the infrastructure to go and sell um, to sell its wares uh, around the world. That's where government is. Um, uh, the only place in the country, the only mobile authority. FTI is growing faster than London, is Tees Valley, because you have a mayor there who has been the star of this conference, who goes out and yeah. sells. And I think we need to do exactly the same thing for life sciences around the country as well. Um, and he's done it very successfully with the theory industry. We need to do exactly uh, the same uh, with life sciences. And it's really interesting model, I think, to <coughs> transform the economic geography of the country. Mm -hmm. um, Maggie, I'm going to yeah. come to you next. Yeah, I just want to sort of answer the gentleman's back to question about you know, how he sees things. One thing that's frustrated all my working life has been the silos that exist. And I think that what the pandemic has shown, really particularly with the Vaccines Task Force, is that we can't work in silos. And it, that really has broken down the silos so that everybody's working together. And I think it's taken away that uh, not invented here scenario. And I think we need to do more of that to get over those uh, the, the issues that you, you talk about. We can all learn from each other. We can all have the galleries, we can all then be ambitious for life sciences. But while we, you know, but if people continue to work in silos, we won't get there. And it's silos in the silos quite often as well. Uh, but I think you know, we, there are lessons to be learned from the pandemic. It's a really, really good lesson to be learned. And that's one of them, it's just collaborative working is so necessary to, to get the, the even more out of what we've got already. So, do you want to answer the gentleman yeah, over there? Yeah. I can't obviously speak for what's happened in the past. But I spent a lot of my working life in the diagnostics industry. So I understand where you're coming from completely, but perhaps we could chat afterwards about it and you can learn from that again. Once again, it's lessons learned and how we move forward. You know, I'm passionate about the diagnostic industry. As I say, it has been all, all my working life, so we need to make sure that we've got a solid one here. Thank you, Maggie. And can I just ask, um, I don't, I'm not sure the microphones are working as well as they should be, so if people can sort of speak about oh, it, okay. then um, I've just heard some in the back. Um, I, so I would just kind of add, add my thoughts really on um, on the funding situation. Um, I, I used to work at Innovate UK, I'm very evangelical about the organisation and I think there is a, a role really um, I suppose to increase the commitment to Innovate UK given their role is so central to underpinning many of the businesses working in life sciences. The industry is, is dominated by SMEs um, the, the way that the kind of product development cycles of, of drug discovery and, and diagnostics companies work it is that they're in quite a volatile situation and grant funding is, is critical actually to, to many of those companies getting through the first few years. Um, so I think that there is a role that the government can increase that commitment to Innovate UK and that will really support um, the, the industry 
um, given how fundamental grants are to, to research and development of, of treatments and, and diagnostics for the future. I would say that an observation is, is that, that the funding that does exist tends to be focused on creating the new. Um, in the UK, I suppose, you know, the, the clues in the title. But what is that mechanism to, to kind of pick up on the gentleman that back's comment about scale? Where is the mechanism to scale innovation? Um, where is the, the, the funding um, to take a product and make that you know, widespread throughout the UK? I think that actually, I, I'm not sure really we've got the deep enough pockets to do that. And I think that's something we need to address actually in, in terms of the scale question. Fascinating. Um, thank you. Uh, if anyone else has questions, please do put up your hand. But I'm going to ask one of my own. I'll come to you in a, in a minute. Um, so, but I'll, I'll, I'll add it to my question. Um, but my question is this. So in the last um, year and a half, uh, the, the kind of scientific and medical community have um, been forced to change the way they operate in a whole myriad of ways. The MHRA has uh, massively accelerated various processes, has gone above and beyond and scaled up its, uh, its approval um, uh, systems um, uh, in a kind of completely brilliant ways. And we should all be extremely, extraordinarily thankful for all of that work. I just wonder, are there lessons, obviously this has been an extraordinary time, but are there lessons for a less extraordinary time, for a more ordinary time, that we can take from that? And can we, can we perhaps, given, given the extent to which the pandemic has forced us to rethink the way we operate, are there specific things that people on the panel think we should be adopting as kind of standard practice, business as usual, um, from the pandemic in order to, um, to make the whole ecosystem work better, more effectively, um, deliver uh, products and um, uh, treatments for people um, uh, more quickly or more effectively than perhaps we could do before. So that's my question. And then this gentleman here has his own. Yeah, uh, Paul from back again. I'm the head of government affairs at Takeda Pharmaceuticals, the largest Japanese pharmaceutical company in the world. Um, uh, we, we invest very heavily in UK biotech, UK biotech partnerships. Where, where we invest less heavily is in um, uh, clinical trials and, and the, the later the phase, the less investment the UK seems to get from ourselves. But the most interest I have ever had in the UK from our global R&D colleagues is when uh, Novartis struck their headline deal with the NHS over in Kozerum. I know there's some Novartis colleagues in the room who, who are no doubt very proud of that. Um, is there scope for clusters to be able to, uh, to, to offer that sort of um, deal to industry? And is that one way to actually attract investment, uh, arguably the most profitable part of the R&D partner? Thank you very much. So. I am going to go in reverse order to the way in which we did last time. So, Kat, can I come to you first? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. There's the, so there's lots of things I think we've done as an organisation uh, and processes that we, we've changed, you know, changes that we'll, we'll keep. I think, I mean, I can't remember, NHS colleagues will, will be more upset with the figures, but it's something like, I don't know, is it 30 years of digital transformation in four weeks or something? And I think that's, that those are the types of, kind of figures that I, I hear talk to, and you know, that's absolutely fantastic. And I think there's a lot of learning to be to be taken from that, that transformation. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Kat, Maggie, Maggie Chief. Yes, uh, I think coming back to the, um, the clinical trials aspect of the, the vaccines and whether everything was run in parallel rather than sequentially mm -hmm. was so, so important. I mean, I actually believe that what we did in 10 months, not we, not me, but the, <laughs> what was done in 10 months, uh, was normally take 10 years, it had yeah. into the pandemic. And I think we need to learn lessons from that and look to how we can translate that into other areas. And we, we also talk about vaccines, but there's also the, the, the amazing work to be done on therapeutics as well. Mm -hmm. I think once again, we, we need to capture that and use all that to accelerate uh, new therapies and use the model to, to look how we can make to look for therapies for, uh, for dementia, for cancer, and all these other issues in the long term, which will really be part of the leverage of side of things as well. They are so important. Fantastic, thank you, Maggie. Yeah, I um, was going to say almost exactly the same thing. Let me give a brief plug to the Science and Technology and Health Joint Committee COVID Lessons Learned Report, which is due out uh, relatively soon, because it does touch on some of these things, but I don't, I'll get shot by the chairs if I start kind of trailing. <laughs> but, but, but one of the things that um, I, I think is particularly 
um, struck. You know, we're selling a global product here. We all, I, well, I certainly know that North of England and England in general is marvellous, and then Brits combined with the Four Nations, top stuff. But what have we done? Well, okay, so we were very early in the science research. You know, AstraZeneca, it's the jab that's going into many people's arms. We're really expertise in that. But I did also want to highlight what's gone on with the, chi with the drug discovery. And, you know, there are a lot of people enviously looking on at our ability to get very large data sets together within the NHS and then expand it out. And crucially, a willingness to engage you look at the British, you know, the British public are along with us for the ride. You look at the vaccination rates, you look at the participation rates in the, in the drug trials, you know, you even look at the people, extra number of people that have signed up for, for the, uh, the UK Biobank, you know, Sir Patrick Vallance used to, you know, lots of people are like, okay, well, we can't help with COVID because that one's been fixed by Professor Sarah Gilbert et al. But I'll sign up for the Biobank and I'll do my dementia research. If we can harness that, tie it into the SMEs, and then roll it into either data or practical delivery. The UK is the end-to-end -end destination of the world, and we again we just need to go and sell it. Thank you. The whole data set. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And with the consent of yeah. millions of people. People yeah. want. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. No. Yeah. I, I totally agree. It's really, really exciting. Um, we uh, we have a few more questions, but I want to bring in Seamus before I come to the final two uh, um, questions. Yeah. I, I won't come back to that either. That's absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, but you've all, I told you it was going to be tricky this lot because you've all ignored the scale one. Uh, and I don't want to answer that, uh, but I can't really because it's not my gift. I think scale is important. I think that the clusters are probably good ways to organise around R&D. They're very poor ways to organise around service, mm. right? which is quite, you know, quite uh, NHS trust general practice is a good model. Um, certainly one of the most efficient in the planet, but it's not great at consistency, um, and, and that's what gives you the scale of adoption. However, one of the things that we've been um, making a case for is the integrated care systems. Actually, whatever integrated care system gets its act together on, or group of integrated care systems get their act together on innovation, <coughs> being an innovation, um, the, the, the innovation and continuous improvement for safety and outcomes is the driving force behind that integrated care system. That integrated care system is going to be visible from space because you could have three to five million people as a test bed that are constantly looking for what's best, getting it into practice, and driving outcomes with that. But that would take a that would take a, a you almost need to they almost need to bet the house on being the continuous improvement integrated care system at scale. Would would um, NHS England let them? Mm. Yeah, that rhetorical question. Um, but that could be that, that could be the ethos of one or more of these ICSs acting in concert could could create a system that would be very very important yeah. for early adoption. Um, and that if you were trying to create jobs and attract industry to your geography with that pride in place and all the rest, you could you could you could be a hell of an asset to the people that you're serving uh, above and beyond the care. So that was the first bit. Um, lessons, I love the phrase, well, lessons learned from the more ordinary times, isn't it? Yes, like, <laughs> a, a, a novel by Shigure or something. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, but but that, the lessons learned, for, you know, that apply to an ordinary time. The, the joining up of the willingness, of, it's, it's not even consent of people. People are positively bought in. Consent's almost yeah. a, a threshold concept. But what we, yeah. what, what we have in this country is that people, because of their psychological contract with the NHS and the trust that they place in the system, go way beyond that. It's altruism. In the Great North Care Act, we called it being a data donor. Mm. Right? You don't completely lose control of your data, but you opt in in a way that, you, that can change the entire system. Um, and the, 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 the national example of that, there are these really good uh, therapeutics trials that went on in COVID. There's one diagnosis called Condor that didn't didn't do it didn't get the same sort of praise, but that was the really big centres across across Britain. Um, you know, it was it was the Golden Triangle in Newcastle and Manchester, and the really big diagnostics places actually looking at in vitro diagnostics for COVID, and they all shared the data. They all shared the industry contacts. They all shared the the, the academic papers that were published. They they, they just got on with it. 
because that more every time and they're spending under an NHSA banner now, the diagnostics group are looking at Condor Plus. How do they put, keep that Condor concept and that platform of data sharing and interaction with industry, keep it going? And because they need, and all the big trusts, they need to run diagnostics through a, a, an evaluation at scale every day. That's what they do. So the, the lessons learned is make the good stuff business as usual. And that's where, I think that's where they're going. Fantastic. Thank you, Seamus. So I think I've, I've seen three questions. I'm, I probably don't have any time for any more. So um, uh, if I could come to you first, uh, and you and then at the back, if that's okay. And then I will ask our panellists to give concluding remarks um, that try and answer those questions as best they can. So first. Hi, uh, Alex from the British Heart Foundation. Um, I don't know if there's a question, just an observation that uh, one of the things that's kind of been missing from today's discussion is the role of medical research charities. And just sort of a reminder, I guess, to say that we are a, sort of a critical piece of the, the ecosystem. And we're doing a lot of this, so we often fund uh, research outside of the Golden Triangle. So for example, the British Heart Foundation, we have the Data Science Centre. So we're often, we're doing a lot of this already. So I guess it's a bit of a plea not to forget about the role of charities and, uh, and we leverage sort of investment from, from industry and all sorts. So, yeah, just I wanted to make sure that's part of the discussion today. Thank you, that's a, that's a really important point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I was wondering, with respect to vaccine uh, rollout, are there any issues around compliance and accuracy? Sorry, the last. Are there any issues around compliance and accuracy of information? Are there, are there specific things you're referring to? Um, well, I can see how, um, on some, in some ways, it's a very good thing for everyone, for a population to be vaccinated. So there's whole population interests, and then there's individual cases where it may not be necessary. But um, nevertheless, compliance continues. Okay. Okay. But um, that, I mean. Yeah. yeah we'll, see, we'll see what the panel think. Um, and to the back. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name's Sarah Madden. I work for Midas, which is. So really important. Uh, with regards to compliance of vaccines, um, I heard a stat yesterday which shows I think there's compliance and people are coming forward uh, 
in the droves, really. But there's now, um, in England alone, because it was a, something from NHS England, that there's 80 million jabs being carried out. And if everybody held their hands, it would take everybody four times around the planet. So I think that shows that you know, there's that people are compliant and they are having access to data twice the questions. So and there's a lot of information on the on the websites as well. And the lady at the back, I'm going to answer your question in a slightly different way. One thing I think sometimes can determine where investment goes from um, the from the industry is the workforce. And I'm passionate about inspiring kids and what even at, at primary school level to go down the STEM subject, STEM route, because if they're not inspired early enough, they'll go down the route, so it'll be too late when they've perhaps not quite got the grade they need at, at, at maths at quite a basic level. I think we need an awful lot more to be inspiring our youngsters to take up the sciences. I, mean, I don't know what inspired me, but um, sometimes it's to be teachers, sometimes it's to do with just sort of latching onto something, uh, and it's just other things that just determine where kids go, and if we can influence that, influence that in any way to make sure we've got the right workforce for the future, then that's so important. Thank right, you. Thank um, you. Uh, my question was more about um, oh, sorry, the I accuracy of the yeah. information uh, given with respect to forcing compliance, yeah, where yeah, it may not be. So I think I think Catherine's going to answer the question. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll do it in order. Um, medical charity researchers, I, I, can you tell I'm ambitious for the north of England, right? Um, I, no, but, 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 one, but one of the things that I, I think we can push forward with is mental health research. At the moment, we're doing a little bit too much of, let's make some, put someone in a safe space and give them a cup of tea and have a chat. You look at postpartum psychosis with pregnancy. You look at some of the revel revelations in today's press about electrodes curing deep depression. I would love for us to be addressing the mental health issues and addiction issues that are so far at the base of lots of our problems and using this ecosystem to push it very much like Cancer Research House and British Heart Foundation has. I would love to pick that up afterwards. I will be your champion in Parliament. Um, I did, I'm terribly sorry, I've missed your name, but you are from Manchester, so therefore that's a huge tick in the box. <laughs> I, um, I understood that you meant forced compliance. I don't want to live in a country where we force people to get jobs. I am extremely proud of the amount of people that have come forward based on the open evidence, but I am not queuing anyone up in handcuffs to get a job, ever. It's not how I am wired up. And then from a Midas perspective, I will defer to the minister because she's right. So if you need someone with my accent to help you, I'm very happy to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I'm going to answer two of those questions. Uh, and I'm not the best person to talk about vaccines compliance, which we've already addressed. But no, uh, yeah, great to highlight the role of medical research charities. Um, we, we work closely with a, uh, a number of charities. We're not just a provider of space. We provide connections to the 500 or so companies in the portfolio. And, it's really important for business to have that charity engagement. It's obviously a credibility point that was raised earlier, but the you know, access to patients and um, the vital role that the, the charities play through uh, through that. But I, I would say actually, just remember that charities also are very innovative. And I think the role of charities and innovation is often very overlooked. Um, my organisation, Broadway SciTech, is, is actually working with Cancer, Re Cancer Research UK on an oncology development program. So we're working to scout the best innovations in um, cancer diagnostics and treatments. Um, many of those are um, tiny companies or academic researchers that are thinking of spinning out a company. And we developed a program where we can get those best ideas, get a business wrapped around them and get those new products developed. And that wouldn't be happening without our close partnership with CIUK, who are very, you know, very forward-thinking charity, as are many. And I think it's, the key message really is just to not forget the role of charities in innovation. Um, the, 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 the last point really on, um, yeah, no, thanks uh, to, to colleagues at Midas, who my organisation work with closely. Yeah, a big pocket of cash would be absolutely fantastic, I think, in terms of luring companies into the UK, into our various cities and regions. It, you know, it's, it's, it's not always there. And, and, unrealistic in, in most cases but I think there's something around getting the playbook straight you know what are the things in our various cities and regions that we're good at and having I suppose the the common sense and the 
the critical friends are telling us actually you might not be world leading in that. Otherwise, you end up with you know 50 UK cities who are all absolutely brilliant at everything. And when you're at the outside of the UK looking in, it's really difficult to get an understanding of, of, of what the key strengths of the, of the regions are. And um, through it, when I reference the, the NHSA report on the life science supercluster, which kind of goes into some detail about key strengths. Um, I'm a member of Cheshire and Warrington's local enterprise partnership, and we're doing some work at the moment to really get under the bonnet of some of those key strengths in, in Cheshire and Warrington. So we can start to talk about, hang on, what's on the path to this world leading? So there's definitely something around getting your story straight, making the offer strong, and you know, pushing forward what you're good at, but just you know, not claiming to be great at everything, actually. What are we, UK leading and world leading? Thank you very much, Pam. We're right on time, so Seamus, final word. <laughs> Um, but if you keep it as brief as possible, that'd be fine. Sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, right, okay, so um, I'm, I'll, do the, I'll do the charities one. The, um, the role of charities it is inextricably linked to identity. Because if you have trust in your, in your service provider, in your, in your clinician, in your clinical team, that's fabulous. But your identity as a, as, as a patient, someone with a condition is very often around the charity and around the communities that, that, and those those communities are absolutely essential for the for the willingness of people to contribute their time their data their their, their, their dna whatever it is and so that's absolutely and that does play out because the ahsms are in charge of rolling out uh, access to pcsk9 inhibitors for familial hypercholesterolemia amongst other lipid uh, conditions and and that has been very very heavily driven by the by the, by the history of, of BHF and others. But the, the, the place, I think, I think you're absolutely right, mental health is the place where we, it's less about drugs than about how we- What's the underlying biological mechanisms? Under, underlying know. biological mechanisms and behavior change. And this is, this, this is a little bit to do with the vaccines uptake. We need to change people's behaviors in a lot of different ways. They need evidence, but that's not sufficient. They need trust, that's not enough either. They need confidence and they need to see data evolve. Scientists have to get a lot better at saying we don't know, we're still discovering this. Yeah. And all the way through the pandemic, we were, everybody was wiping everything down for months. It's airborne, right? Mm -hmm. We figured that out. And actually ventilation is far more important than wiping down surfaces. Figuring those things out as we go is absolutely crucial because if we're going to solve other problems like climate change, our behaviours have to change massively. Mm -hmm. Not just get a jab at home so you don't die, it's a fairly short conversation with me. <laughs> but if you if you do that, if you can't be, change behaviours in that way and wear a mask, what chance have we got of, of change, making the change that uh, is going to stop climate change? Indeed. So thank you so much, um, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. I'm sorry, we don't have more time to uh, kind of get into these questions. We could have, I suspect, gone on much longer. But um, uh, just, I'm just going. I'm not going to try and sum up everything. It was an enormously positive, optimistic discussion. Clearly, lots of areas of opportunity for the future, but also a recognition that the UK already has an incredibly strong foundation on which to build here. And the last 18 months have proved that more than anything else. And I was really struck by some of the learnings from, uh, from that period. Obviously, a very difficult time, but a time that we can take strength from um, and, uh, and take some, some lessons that can uh, help guide us in more ordinary times, as you say. Okay. Um, so, uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you uh, in particular to our panel um, and to NHSA for supporting us uh, in putting on this event. And if you can just join me in a round of applause for our panel.